Okay, well, uh, li I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and uh, I think I will follow Henry's lead from the first day. I will try to say a few things that are perhaps a little bit provocative, but uh, also uh, hopefully a little bit informative. Um, now, why is uh, someone with a background in physics uh, working in genomics, or at least uh, interested in genomics? And I think the answer is more or less summarized by this slide, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Um, I would just say that uh, for the young people who are starting out in this field of research, I, I really envy you because I think we're entering a golden era for this kind of work, and I think we're going to see tremendous progress in the next uh, few decades. Um, one observation that's often made in Silicon Valley is that when you look at sustained technological progress, um, it's often the case that uh, we overhype in the short run the implications of, of the technological innovation, but in the long run, we often uh, under rate, we often underestimate the long-term consequences. And I think that's actually already happened uh, in genomics, where there was an original sort of boom in the early uh, 2000s after the first human genome project, and people got a little bit discouraged. And now when we look at sample sizes of hundreds of thousands, people are a bit discouraged. But I think if you look at the long-run potential of this kind of research, uh, I think it's uh, actually somewhat unbounded. So um, what particular skill sets, uh, I think, uh, are, are going to be important for advancing this subject? Well, I, I think there are quite a few. I only listed four here because it's already hard to find a Venn diagram with four sets. Um, but uh, here I've listed genom genomics, population genetics, social science, psychometrics, and something I'll emphasize a little bit uh, later in the talk, algorithms and high-dimensional statistics. And some of the things I say today I think will be sort of obvious to some subset of these communities, but then actually counterintuitive, actually counterintuitive to people from other subsets uh, of, of this community. And so I think uh, maybe they're worth discussing further. Um, now, let me just say what I think are the desirable properties for quantitative phenotypes. Um, you'd like something that you can measure reliably and is fairly stable. You'd like something that maybe has some predictive power, predicts something about the real world. And of course, you'd like it to have some genetic causes uh, for, for it to be heritable. And I guess, you know, I may, be a, an ex I may be an outlier in this opinion, but I actually feel that cognitive ability properly defined is somewhat comparable to height uh, on these criteria. Not, not quantitatively so, but qualitatively so. And so um, I don't think it's surprising that uh, we're going to be able to make progress on this. So um, my attitude toward the construct of cognitive ability is, uh, I think, a pretty pragmatic one. I, I, I'm not a person who believes that there's some mystical specialness uh, in the principle, uh, in the, in the um, largest uh, axis of this ellipsoid. But I do think it's quite interesting that if you uh, create a battery of tests and you give them to people, uh, the population generally doesn't distribute uh, uniformly at all in the, in the space of possibilities, but actually occupies a much smaller subspace. And of course, it's, you could just view it as a kind of information compression or data compression to describe the data economically using a scalar number. And obviously, the scalar number you would use is the coordinate, the projection onto the um, major axis of this ellipsoid. So I think this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And then the question really is just uh, what practical consequences can you get from this construct? Does it actually predict outcomes? Is it heritable? Can one figure out what uh, uh, genes in particular are influencing it? So at least for me, uh, cognitive ability is by far the most interesting phenotype at all, uh, of all. And um, the human brain uh, is arguably the most complex known object in the universe. I think it's very tough to come up with anything that's even close. Um, and it's constructed from a very small program, a gigabit program, which is probably only a subset of our total DNA. And uh, as, as illustrated uh, in Paul's talk this morning, it's, it's clear that that program doesn't just build the brain uh, in, in isolation. It builds it in interaction with an environment that it, that it learns from. But nevertheless, it's amazing that we can build such a complex thing from such a short program. Now, there's obviously a big cognitive gap between humans and chimps. Uh, but we only differ at a few tens per thousand base pairs if you look at the whole genome. Recently, they were able to obtain high-quality sequences of Neanderthal genomes. And uh, if you compare a modern human with a Neanderthal, we differ at a few base pairs per thousand. You should compare that to the differences between, say, any two individuals in this room where we differ by about one per thousand base pairs. So there's a slight difference between uh, the genomes of humans and Neanderthals. But uh, I think the impact in terms of the actual uh, cognitive abilities is quite large. So if you look at what Neanderthals were able to do in 300,000 years, uh, their technological development was really quite limited. Uh, the parts of the planet that they were able to colonize was quite limited. 
And uh, by comparison, modern humans have been much more successful and have had a much bigger impact uh, on the planet. And I think you could argue that the majority of scientific and technological progress is really driven by outliers in, uh, in cognitive ability. Um, those curves, the Moore's Law curve and the sequencing cost curve uh, that, we, that I showed in the earlier slide, which um, are quite impressive, those are, if you really look at the individuals that are driving those trends, uh, it's a very, very small subset of society, and I think that if you were able to actually measure their G-scores, you would find them to be quite unusual. Um, one, uh, I guess, rather uh, controversial conjecture that I'll make in this talk is that relatively small genotype tweaks can elevate uh, the level of human cognition substantially. And actually, after I, after I give the argument for this, some people will probably say it's a completely obvious uh, result, but uh, when you first state it, people often don't believe it. Okay, so let's talk about an actual quantitative model uh, for a trait like intelligence. This could also be height. Um, let me say that the formula I've written here is really appropriate for a case where, say, we're looking at people who, are, who have all experienced or will all experience in the course of their development a fairly positive environment. So I don't want to talk about uh, uh, um, deprivation, and I don't want to talk about a very strong gene environment interactions. I just want to imagine that we have a fairly ideal uh, circumstance for developing these individuals and just ask uh, at what level the genes are influencing that development. And so you could write the most general function, if you wanted, of the genotype, uh, which is the, the object G, and uh, there are a bunch of parameters in this model. So Xi are uh, linear effect sizes. Uh, Zij are nonlinear effect sizes, which couple individual gene effects to each other. Um, you could have even higher order interactions, and of course you can have the noise. The noise is always irreducible. Uh, so um, I think the one observation which I think some people in this meeting will find counterintuitive and others uh, find um, fairly plausible is that the linear term actually dominates the variance in this uh, formula. And um, this is something I'm... If Why do you think so? You'll forgive me crudely about nonlinearity. So... Um, functional approximation work, that, this is exactly what you would not do. So, um, I, can, I, I have some slides uh, at the end that uh, I can go into to discuss this further, but let me just make the simple observation that if you truncate this model and you just use the linear part, and you try to do things like plant and animal breeding or predicting phenotype in plant and animal systems, you're quite successful. So, um, you know, you, it's hard to argue with that practical success. Now, I can you give... If you make claims about human cognitivity, then I'm not sure the extrapolations... Sure, that absolutely. So, we'll, and, we'll find, and, and we'll find out whether that's the case. But, but, but I have, you know, um, if, if I have time later to go into those slides, I can give sort of pretty deep evolutionary reasons why the linear term has to dominate. And I, I think those are actually interesting, so hopefully maybe we'll have time to discuss them. So, um, um, my belief is that we'll extract these effect sizes for a variety of human traits. Um, certainly for height, you wouldn't, uh, I think you wouldn't find that in a particular, uh, particularly controversial claim. Um, maybe for cognitive ability it is. Okay, so um, this slide shows the history, recent history of uh, GWAS. And um, the typical pattern that you'll see is that when your sample size is insufficient, you don't get any uh, genome-wide significant hits. Sorry, the laser, I don't know if you can see that. So when the sample size is too small, you don't expect to get any genome-wide significant hits. But then once you reach some threshold, you expect steady growth in the number of hits uh, as your discovery sample size gets larger. And we can already make a simple extrapolation here. So if we, if we, if we, if we imagine that this is following uh, some kind of line um, and we go, say, out an or another order mag of magnitude in sample size, say to 2 million, you already hit some level of hits like a few thousand, okay? And so one could say probably at that point we're going to have a pretty good handle on the genetic architecture and maybe capture a pretty good chunk of the total variance. And I think someone was telling me today about a, a, p a paper by Vicious Group in which um, with I think about 200,000 or 250,000 people, they capture about 40% of the variance for height. So uh, if you give me another order of magnitude here, I think we can do even better than that. Okay, so one of the most interesting questions or one of the most crucial questions is how many causal variants are there? for a particular trait. And uh, let me describe a simple method uh, that we've actually tried out on some data, although we haven't published the results, um, that give an estimate of roughly about 10,000 causal variants, both for height and for um, uh, IQ. 
And the analysis basically goes like this. Um, create, uh, take a big sample of people for whom you have SNP genotypes uh, and uh, phenotype scores, let's say uh, IQ scores, and consider all possible pairs of individual, individuals in the population. And look for an effect in which the average distance between pairs of individuals uh, increases uh, as their phenotype difference increases. And if you average over the whole population, you can hope to pick out the part of the genotype distance that depends only on the phenotype difference. Okay? And that's an estimate, if you think about it, of roughly how many SNPs one would have to flip to, say, take a low uh, score individual and make them into a higher scoring individual. So that's a, just a straightforward calculation that you can do on existing data. Um, we did it on uh, the ALSPAC data set and the TEDS data set, which are two UK uh, samples. And the reason we didn't publish it is because the numbers we got were typically something like of order 40 SNPs per standard deviation and a similar number for height. Um, but the background noise, it's actually difficult to estimate what the background statistical noise is for this kind of calculation. And um, we weren't sure that this was really significant, so it might have just been in the noise. However, you can uh, deduce an upper bound from this. So if the um, number of SNPs required to cause a 1SD change in the phenotype had been in the hundreds, it would have actually been larger than the noise that we saw. And so you can sort of guess some kind of upper bound from this. Now, the number that you're deducing here, this 40 or 100, is sort of like the square root of S. And so from this, you can get an estimate for S. And we only had, I think, total of, I don't know, maybe less than 10,000 uh, people to try this out on. So um, if anybody has a larger sample size, I'd like to try this analysis on their, uh, their sample set. OK, so let's just take it uh, as an assumption that um, there are something like 10,000 causal variants. Um, from evolutionary arguments, you can, uh, you can make the case that the minor alleles will tend to have the negative effect on the trait. So if you have a trait that's been under selection for a long time, it's typically the minor alleles that have a depressing effect. Um, it also follows from evolutionary arguments that um, the, the majority of the uh, causal variants um, will have low MAF. And so just yeah, for, for the sake of building a model, you can choose some particular MAF value like 0.1. And then from those two assumptions, you can get to the standard deviation for this kind of toy model. And the standard deviation is basically something like 0.1n all to the 1 half. Okay? And so if you take the standard deviation to correspond to about 40 uh, extra negative variants in an individual, um, capital N is about 10,000, you get a completely self-consistent um, tinker toy kind of model for this particular uh, quantitative trait. And so you can think of each individual on this trait as a list of uh, pluses or minuses uh, at 10,000 different uh, loci. Um, about 10% of these symbols will be minuses. 90% roughly will be pluses. A typical individual will have about 1,000 minuses, plus or minus about 40. People who are particularly intelligent might have fewer of these minor alleles. They might have 900 instead of 1,000. And what's interesting about this model, um, it's very crude, but if you actually look at what people do in population genetics and animal breeding, this is not different from the kind of model that they're dealing with. Um, of course, you could put in uh, individual effect sizes for each of these variants in this simplified version of the model. I've just set them all to be equal. Um, now you can ask a following question. You, you, the following question, you could say, if I have an ideal individual who has really radically fewer of these minus alleles uh, than the average in the population, what is the upper limit? on the trait. And you can see there's a huge amount of variance that's available, uh, you know, leading to phenotypes that we just really can't imagine. This conclusion is actually completely robust. It really just depends on the assumption that there are a large number of variants. So if you have a large number of variants, the square root of n is much less than n. And you typically have a order square root of n standard deviations that you can achieve. Now, this sounds a little crazy unless you're actually familiar with population genetics. So if you actually look at what animal breeders and plant breeders are able to accomplish through directed selection, they are actually able to achieve shifts in phenotype like this. Okay, and so I think somebody put into the Dropbox folder for this meeting a particular example in which they talked about, uh, I think, the oil content of corn, something like that. Um, but there are many examples. Um, one of my favorite examples is, uh, I think it's... Uh, 
flying speed of Drosophila. So uh, there's an experiment where you have a wind tunnel and you turn up the speed in the wind tunnel and the Drosophila that are not able to resist that uh, headwind you dispose of. The ones that are able to resist the headwind you keep breeding and breeding. And you can cause many, many uh, standard deviations of improvement of the flying ability of these Drosophila. Now some people would say, well, if you... 7 meters per second to 107. Okay. So, wow. seriously? Yes. Wow. So, so many people would say, um, if, you, if you push the phenotype that hard, there must be general fitness effects. So surely, yes, you can find some uh, Drosophila that flies really fast. You can find some chicken that lays eggs at 10 times the rate of a wild chicken. Those are the, the eggs that we actually eat. Uh, you, can, you can find cattle that uh, put on weight and produce milk far in excess of the ones that exist in the wild. But typically the claim would be, well, that person is not going to be very fit. There are all kinds of negative consequences. And uh, that may be the case, but in the Drosophila uh, experiment that I just described, they actually did test the fitness level of these um, super uh, fast flying Drosophila, and they were able to breed quite well and reproduce and compete quite well with the ordinary Drosophila. Um, okay, did, did, am I really down to one minute? Not strict, not strict. okay. Um, Okay, let me discuss um, some mathematical techniques that um, I think will be brought to bear on this problem. Um, so what are we trying to do here? Uh, we have data that looks like this, a list of phenotypes for a bunch of individuals. For each individual, we have a genotype matrix, and then we have a uh, set of effect sizes that we want to learn, and then there's an error term. Um, I believe that X is quite sparse. So if you have, uh, say, 10,000 causal variants among 1 million SNPs or 3 billion base pairs, the vector x is mostly zeros. There are just a few, there's a small sprinkling of non-zeros in x, but almost everything is zero. And uh, this will be an underdetermined problem for some time because p is much greater than n. n is the number of uh, individuals you have in your sample. Now, um, when I thought, when I think about the future of this field, the, the sort of fundamental question to me is, what is the most effective method for solving this problem? So given a data set like this, what is the most effective practical method for solving this problem? And I was surprised to learn that um, there are some uh, very powerful and nearly optimal results that coincidentally have just been developed in the last roughly five or seven years in mathematics. And they go under a general name called uh, compressed sensing. And uh, the paper that I put into Dropbox describes the application of these methods to genomics. And uh, one of the interesting things about the result is that the amount of data that is required to actually solve this problem, it grows linearly in S, but only logarithmically in P. So uh, having very large P is not really a big problem. Uh, the real issue is what is S. Okay, so uh, I stole this picture, so the notation's all wrong. But it, it sort of expresses, uh, it gives you a sort of pictorial uh, image of what the, the matrix problem looks like. You have a bunch of uh, measurements of the phenotype. You have these giant matrices which are just composed, uh, comprised of genomes. And then you have a very sparse effects vector. And I often joke that the single most valuable list of 10,000 numbers in the world uh, is probably this vector for cognitive ability. Okay, I can't, can't think of another list of 10,000 numbers that's as valuable because it gives you the architecture of how our brain works. Okay, so how does this method work, uh, compressed sensing? Um, there are a variety of objective functions that one can consider uh, minimizing uh, in, in this compressed sensing scheme. The most familiar one uh, is, is, uh, has already been used in uh, a, st a statistical method called lasso. And so what you have here is a least squared kind of error. L2 means L L2 norm. And then you add a penalty term. So there's a tunable parameter lambda, and then you have something which is... Um, the sum of absolute values of the individual entries in X. And this objective function is convex. So what that means is that uh, finding its minimum is extremely easy. And comp computationally, uh, the methods for doing that is, are very fast. Um, there are a bunch of really powerful theorems which are performance guarantees for this method given sufficient conditions on, sorry, that should not be A, that should be G, given con sufficient conditions on G. The main issue is conditions on G and these properties are largely independent of the properties of X, other than the sparsity. Okay? And what we've done in our paper is check that matrices made of actual human SNP genomes satisfy uh, the necessary conditions for these theorems to apply. Um, one of the properties that the method has is that 
there will be a phase transition in the performance of the algorithm. So you imagine the performance of the algorithm for some fixed value of heritability and some fixed value of S, uh, and you vary the amount of data you have. There's a very sharp behavior as you cross this phase transition boundary. And what happens is as you, as you cross that special uh, value of the, uh, the data threshold, um, once you cross it, you're able to select all of the uh, causal variants. You will not get the actual effect sizes uh, to high accuracy, but you get the, the actual set, the actual support of the vector x. And from our simulations, we've deduced the value of this threshold for a trait that has heritability of, additive heritability of about 0.5. Um, that threshold is about 30 times s. So if you have a trait with s of 10,000, you need roughly 300,000 individuals to get across that boundary. Sorry, but we're minimizing over x, and we are imposing x to these parts at some degree that is no. Not so us, you're minimizing over all x. There's no condition on x. This penalty okay. causes the method to favor sparsity. Oh, so and that's why it's one. Yeah, and the, and the performance guarantees say that if you do minimize this function for well-conditioned g, uh, you will actually find if you're above this threshold, you'll actually find the full support of the oh, vector. This is just so. I understand that the penalty for the for this person is coming from the L1 no, but it looks arbitrary. I'm so going. L so in the theorems there's a there's guidance on how you have to choose lambda. So to prove the theorem you have to choose lambda above a certain okay. value. What about why L1? Oh why L1? Yeah, because no, I understand the okay. penalty, but so, I, I could So L zero obviously just counts sparsity. So just count the number yeah. of non zero entries. That is not a convex function. This is the closest convex function which is uh, overwhelmingly likely to actually find the correct uh, vector. So, th this is a so this is quite a two an L two penalty will not kill things; it'll just multiply things. Yeah, so L, things L that are negative will stay negative. No, I, I was between yeah. L zero and L one. Yeah, L L zero is the best, but L zero is computationally intractable. L one is computational tra computationally tractable, and then there are performance guarantees. L two doesn't actually do what you want. So. Um, this is actually quite a deep subject, and so uh, if you're interested in the literature, it's, it's quite a big literature, including papers by Fields medalists and things like this. So uh, uh, I, I, I recommend that you explore it. Um, so these are simulations from our uh, paper, and what's interesting is that this phase boundary is computed actually more or less analytically from purely mathematical considerations. Uh, this is actual simulation data from real genomes. And uh, you can, if, you, if you actually look at our results, you can see that we more or less reproduce this uh, phase transition line perfectly. So to conclude, I would say you typically are, just to be conservative rather than take that 300,000 number uh, seriously, of course, we didn't really know that S was 10,000. That was just an order of magnitude guess. I would say that when we get to of order a million phenotype genotype pairs, there's going to be a phase transition or an actual qualitative shift in our ability to actually pull out these uh, causal variants. And I think that's going to happen for sure sometime in the next decade uh, for height. And I think the main issue for uh, cognitive ability is really whether we can uh, phenotype uh, our samples properly. And I think the talk earlier this morning really gets to that point, that we will definitely get this number of whole genome sequences probably in the next decade. But the question is, how many of them will have uh, cognitive scores attached to them? Yeah. The, the lasso has an analytic solution you present here, right? No, 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 no. You have to solve it uh, uh, using a computer. To optimize it? Yeah. So the other thing, too, is that you, before you were saying that you did SNPs over greater than something frequency, right? I mean, because most of the very, very variants you were saying are deleterious, so they don't even find them, right? So just to build this uh, toy model, I just made an assumption about a typical MAF. Yeah. Um, well, the thing is, we probably will have all alleles of that frequency within like five years. It's yes, not, it's not sure, a problem. sure. So, so once, you, once you've got that, you don't even need to sequence things, right? You just have to... Um, there's a certain amount of variance that's going to be accounted for by SNPs, and right. you, know, you can estimate that using GCTA, yeah. um, and you'll probably be able to recover that first. But there's probably a ton of variation that's due to things like uh, copy number variants, structural variants, things like that that you only can see uh, using actual sequencing. And so if you want to get, you know, I don't know really what H, H squared is for this trait. Uh, maybe it's 0.7 or something. To get that full 0.7, you're probably going to want to use whole genomes. I see. So in other words, you're not going to just do this just on SNPs. You're going to actually be doing something. Well, it's whatever data set comes in, 
you can do it. We, we, we chose our parameters h squared of 0.5. That's appropriate actually for SNPs according to the GCTA results. So. Yeah, you know, the reason why I was wondering is because that, that makes it much, much easier to do. You know, you yeah. should be able to get a chip platform at 100 bucks this person. And for that yeah. matter, you don't even need to keep things separate. You just have to just pile up the counts and yep. you should be able to, yeah. Yep. Now, you, you can tell from my talk that I'm most interested in cognitive ability, but obviously this will work with any uh, quantitative trait. And the question, the point is just that uh, this is a this is a better method for getting the uh, getting a cognitive variance. Um, I want, if, if we have time, I'd like to address uh, this question of linearity because I think this is a very deep question that there's within the four populations that I described on the earlier slide. There's quite a divergence in the view on this, and so I, if I could just quickly go through these slides, I think it might be worthwhile. So. Why are phenotype differences within a population approximately linear functions of genotype? They're approximately linear functions of genotype. And that just shocks anybody with a molecular background. That's shocking to them because they know how complicated the actual mechanisms are. Um, people maybe from social science are not expecting that to be the case either. Um, this is widely discussed, and it's, it's widely discussed in population genetics and also in animal and plant breeding, et cetera, et cetera. So let me give you a kind of a caricature of the discussion. So here's a simple example. Suppose you have a, a diploid uh, creature and capital C is the most common variant, and little c is the rare variant, um, there are lots of different types of epistasis that you could build into your model. So imagine that the effect of little c, little c is not twice the effect of little c, big c. So that would be a nonlinearity. Um, you could also build multi-locus interactions where the value of a second locus controls the sign of the effect for the first locus, et cetera, et cetera. You can build all those kinds of things. If the variants are relatively rare, so suppose the MAF for little c is something like 0.1 or 0.2, it's overwhelmingly likely that um, people, uh, the variation in the population is controlled by this versus this, and this is sort of a small perturbation on that. So mathematically, only say 1% of the population is little c, little c, and even though little c, little c is not following a linear curve, it's a relatively small effect in capturing the overall variation in the population. Okay? So for example, if it were true that the causal variance on a selected trait turn out to be typically uh, rare, then that would suppress the nonlinearity. No one is saying the nonlinearity is not there. It's just a, question, a quantitative question of whether it accounts for 10% of the variance, 30% of the variance. Yeah, go ahead. So, so the argument you just gave is one for dominance effects that basically yep. being very important. Yep. Do, does it all carry over to these epistasis or gene-gene interactions? Yes. So you, you can do the same argument because basically if, if the MAFs for the causal variance tend to be small, then you typically are dealing with a subset of cases, and that's well approximated by linear uh, function. There, there's so there's just not as many points that the hyperplane has to go through as you might not even think. We keep just write CC and DD and sort of you know yeah. read, I, figure it out. I'm sorry, I still don't have the intuition. I'm still struggling on. I, I was I was I'm good with this. What you wrote yeah. here. You answered me, it again. I, I didn't really get. It. Let me. I, I'm happy to go into that uh, later, but let me let me get through a little bit more of this because I think there's some important concepts introduced. So. A high degree of nonlinearity at the genetic level, so in the actual architecture there are nonlinear effects, can still correspond to almost linear aggregate variation between two individuals. And my colleague, my collaborator, Carson Chow, likes to say that he thinks, he's another physics, physicist who's in biology now, he likes to think of biology as a linear combination of nonlinear gadgets. So you have nonlinear gadgets, which are really quite complicated, and you, can't, you don't want to break those gadgets up, but there can be linear combinations of those gadgets uh, and, the, and the variation that's easiest to get out in your analysis is this, linear comp is this linear stuff. Let me just go through this one extra slide and then we can stop. So now there's an evolutionary explanation for all this. Um, it turns out that additive variation is easier for evolution to act on. If I have a nonlinear gadget, if, I, if, if in order to get the organism to be able to do something, I have to build a nonlinear gadget involving 10 genes, those 10 genes can easily be ripped apart through sexual reproduction, right? There's no guarantee that the, if the male has the benefit of this nonlinear gadget and the female doesn't, the, it's very unlikely that the offspring will have it. However, if I can create variation using additive variation, there's a much higher chance that that can be passed on, sele uh, passed on um, to the offspring without, without being destroyed. Okay. If you have haplosufficiency, that is just you need a single copy, single working copy, why doesn't that solve the problem as well? Sure, but it, these complicated traits often are influenced by hundreds or thousands of genes. And if you need to move this, so you say you have a species and you suddenly select it to a bunch of, you suddenly apply a bunch of selective pressure and you want to move it in some direction, the way that the organism is likely to respond is, is 
in additive variance by just basically changing frequencies of things that have linear effects. And this is actually memorialized in Fisher's fundamental theorem. It's the fundamental theorem in population genetics. It says that the rate of increase of fitness is approximately given by the additive genetic variance, not the non-additive part, but the additive part. And this approximation is valid as long as you have a sexually reproducing species with recombination timescales smaller than evolutionary timescale. So if evolutionary timescale is many generations, this will be the correct, correct formula. And most of the variation that you see in the population will be due to additive effects. So uh, this, this has been known for a long time in other subfields. Uh, Maze experiment is one of the famous ones. And um, this is a little picture of Variance with negative and positive effect. Negative effect variants get pushed to zero. Positive effect variants get pushed almost to fixation. When you look at this picture at the end of the million years of evolution for intelligence, what you get is some negative variants, the, the, the counterparts of these guys here, and some negative variants here, and they all have low frequencies. And this is the sort of standard model in population genetics. Yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, the, this theoretical prediction that not most of the variants will be additive is, of course, one you can test because it makes, because uh, the different, just from the, looking at the resemblance of different types of relatives. Yep. So in the science paper, we have an appendix that we show for the universe of Swedish brothers born in a 30 year interval, the correlation. So seven different sibling types. And it really looks amazingly additive. So if, so for those who are not persuaded by the theoretical argument, you know, the data are there for anyone to look at. Um, a substantial portion of the heritable variation is, is, is additive. Well, you know, this set of people are not surprised by that. So they, they've known it for quite some time. So, Sorry, yeah. just, so that's for particular phenotypes. Well, we're talking about intelligence. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, it's true for all phenotypes we've looked well, at, but it's less true for the eye. Less true for the Some of the arguments that I used here rely on it having been under selection. So we. I think it's fair to say we're probably a lot smarter than our ancestors three million years ago. So it's pretty clear that intelligence has been under positive selection, so then a lot of these results apply. Probably the same thing for height, because our, a lot of the earlier ancestors were quite small. So, Tell me how you think about the proteonomics data. I mean, proteonomics networks are so nonlinear, so discontinuous, yep. so complicated. And I understand, I understand everything you said, yep. but I'm trying to... Yep. So, Imagine that I have a really complicated uh, nonlinear gadget. I don't remember where I said that. I mean, even worse, let's assume it has a lot of feedback loops embedded in it. Sure. So let's suppose I have a really complicated nonlinear gadget. Um, and that gadget uh, helps me develop uh, vision. Yeah, OK. Uh, but let's suppose there are some little tweaks that also affect the development <coughs> process, not in such a complicated uh, way, but in a, in a way where it's just uh, if you have this variant, the, I don't know what that thing was, neuron-seeking efficiency is a little bit higher. If you have the other variant, neuron-seeking efficiency is a little bit less good. Okay, so that's a, suppose you had a linear effect, but then you have some really complicated machine, which is how this thing actually figures out, you know, that it's near its target, okay? If you suddenly take that species and you just subject it to a bunch of selection, what's the most likely way for it to improve? It's actually most likely that the, the uh, when in that two-variant case, where you just have one variant that gives you better this, Function uh, that just reaches higher frequency in the population. So how did these and nonlinear gadgets arise? How did these really complicated? Well, that's why evolution takes you know billions of years, not <laughs> right. Right. So I mean, to build something like this, obviously, you know, if you're a creationist, you say there's irreducible complexity. We can't build these things, but of course we, of course we do. Um, well, God made them, of course. But um, the the uh, my question I is, I'm with you. <laughs> the, uh, the the so is one one consequence in evolution of the prediction that. Um, asexual reproduction, reproducting, reproducing, um, you know, half pointed species should have a bigger nonlinear component because they can evolve that yep. way and they don't lose the advantage of sexual reproduction. Yep. So, do we find that in the literature? I, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, an expert on evolutionary population genetics. You know, Greg knows a lot more about it than I do, so he might know the answer. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. So, but, but you know, this, this stuff, a lot of this stuff was actually thought through by Fisher, and the great tragedy of Fisher, although he was a genius, was that he lived before there were, was really good technology to test all these implications, but we're in a world now where we can test all these implications, so. I just want to go back to this epistasis point, because yep. I, I, I really yep. want to understand it. Yep. Let's say you had two loci, both of which have a um, major allele frequency of 
Yeah. So then the likelihood of having two major alleles of the two loci is 0.64. I mean, that doesn't seem second order. That, that's, that could matter a lot. So, so the breakup between, it, it's really an open question. I, and if anybody has good data on this, I, I, would, love to, I would love to hear about it. The, the actual breakup invariance between this and this, I don't know what it will actually be for a given trait, but you know, one can guess that this is going to be large and this is going to be somewhat smaller. That, that's all I would say. And so if, if at, at, uh, you know, the thing I'm currently working on with my poor physics postdoc, who I'm forcing to do this because he doesn't, is interested in biology at all, is actually <laughs> lasso generalized to these kinds of models, um, which we're eventually going to do that too. But of course, it's, this, is, this is kind of a solved problem. So uh, if this is a, in any way a decent approximation, that's what you want to start with. Yeah. Can I have a question also about the, the compressed sensing? Yeah. Suppose that, so the, the, the assumption underneath the, the lasso method is that there is, is that there is um, a bunch of loci with literally zero effect and yep. then yep. loci that have positive yep. effects. And suppose that the truth for some complex trait like yep. cognitive ability is that there's a smooth distribution of yep. effect sizes. Yep. Um, and and but you estimate the lasso on, on that data. Are there results on you know whether it's still going to perform well? Yeah. So so let me let me refine your example and say let's suppose there's a distribution of effect sizes and let's suppose it's, it's sort of falling off. Okay. I mean if it's uniform that's a different story. But let's suppose it's sort of falling off. Okay. Um, if it's uniform we would have seen it in the analysis. Okay. So imagine that it's falling off like this and imagine I, I truncate the model at a certain number of SNPs, and then I just set these values to be zero. So that's a related model. And that model has an H squared, which is somewhat reduced relative to the real, the real situation. But that, that second one I can obviously solve using these methods, right? So, so it's clear I can get to successively better approximations to the, the real world, and I'm just giving up some of the heritability by just pretending that some of these very small effect sizes are actually zero. And how important is the decay factor? Um, so nobody knows that question. So uh, for height, there's for the, they have maybe 300 causal variants. You can actually plot it. Now it's a little bit biased relative to the real distribution because of the you know uh, you're more likely to discover a particular variant if it accounts more for more variants. So the MAF, the minor allele frequency, comes in. So it's not a pure sampling of effect sizes from height. But you can you can say something, and you, you get curves like this. And the so. MAF and the effect size are unrelated. Well, they may be correlated, that, so that's part of some deep evolutionary dynamics. But, but in general, yes, there, for a given MAF, there are going to be a range of effect sizes, and for a given range of effect, for a given effect size, there will probably be uh, uh, alleles with all kinds of different uh, MAFs. Oh. They're, they're sort of independent things. So, how, how common is it in the population, and what is its effect size? In some deep dynamical way, they're related. But I can see yeah. why they should be. Yeah. Is there uh, I mean, this this is IID loci, right? So, um, do you, in your lasso approach or compressed sensing, do you uh, just, I mean, in a practical matter, you just prune, or do you have some more complicated structure, error structure for linking so, equilibrium? So, not not sure I fully understood your question. So, this is I assumed in the in the theorems, this is assumed to be IID noise. Um, this is the full SNP matrix, so this could be a, uh, let's suppose you have, you know, 10,000 people here and 500,000 SNPs, so this is a 10,000 by 500,000 matrix, and you literally optimize this, you literally optimize The question it. is about the, the compressed sensor matrix. Oh. Uh, the, uh, the most basic CS theorem set of that is IID. Oh, okay, but so I'm sorry. In the real yeah. world, we have linkage disequilibrium, so how do we deal with that? Oh, was that your question? Sorry. So, yeah, so what will happen is if, if you have um, correlated SNPs in here, what Lasso will typically do is discover one of them and not discover, and forget, deliberately forget about the other one. So if you rerun it several times, it could actually discover uh, different subsets of causal variants, but what you'll find is they're always typically correlated with one that was in the other set. No more questions. So I'll just say something science fiction-y like um, in a hundred years there are gonna be in a hundred years there are gonna be humans walking around who are plus ten 
standard deviations in intelligence and much smarter than anybody who's ever lived in history. So. Who is doing the choose? Pardon me? Why? Who will do the, the, the market? Have the, you market seen the, the market is going <laughs> to choose. You know why? Because if these technologies become available, uh, your daughter, when she chooses to reproduce, will Seven. probably fly to Singapore where she can make sure that son, son. son uh, where she, he or she can make sure that they reduce the number of minuses in the genotype of the child. And what's, when and do the apliotropic effects of that? Maybe that's a good question. Well, so, yes, yeah, so, you know, nobody knows, right? So, so can you really get, can you really get a lot of motion without picking up a lot of bad stuff? Are there any directions in this 10,000 dimensional space that I mean, you can move? Taste tomatoes in versus heirloom tomatoes. Yeah. The market will decide. If the, if the land market is up, again, have you seen the What's that? Have you watched the movie? Well, the, this is our only hope. Tell me what's wrong this is, with that. This tradition. is our only hope against idiocracy. <laughs> no, I think this is really bad news for us because then we should not waste any time doing science. This is because, because, well, because the people who are, we should just select for future scientists and not waste any more time ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, it's not it's a waste of time. Yeah. Say that we do find the 10,000 genes that are related to cognitive yep. ability, and then but they're not all genes. Some of them are going to be like you know yeah, yeah. Uh, regulatory elements, and I mean there's a lot more information Sorry, yeah, than yeah. just genes. Yeah. SNPs that yeah. are related to it. so, uh, and we select them then, and then everybody will have pluses instead. Uh, everybody will have minuses instead of pluses, and so on and so forth. Yep. Will do we have to run geos again after that? And find news. Yeah, I mean, if you if you if if you I were mean, writing a science fiction novel about the next hundred years, um, you would probably have some early rich people coming wanting to do this, and then you have scientists doing follow ups on their children and remeasuring their scores on these quantitative traits, and then updating their models, getting the nonlinear term right, and off we go. And you know, it's funny that uh, you, if you talk about intelligence, this becomes a very controversial thing. Um, Freeman Dyson, a long time ago, wrote about genetic engineering and saying that, well, the, probably the most likely way we're going to colonize space is that we're going to actually alter our genetics so that we can survive better in zero gravity and in a fairly high radiation environment. And no one batted an eyelash about that. They said, yeah, of course, if we explore space, it may be useful to genetically engineer ourselves. But as soon as you go through your, go near this one phenotype, everyone goes nuts. So, yeah. Um, the first thing you do is you try it on a chimp. Yes, absolutely. And then you're really sorry if it succeeds. <laughs> <laughs> That's another good novel. That's another good novel about the next hundred years. Um, yeah. Not, 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 but yes. Yeah. And the other problem with the market deciding is, is that again, from idiocracy in the documentary, we know that what people actually engineered <laughs> was better hair and the other thing. And um, you know, so I'm just saying that you know. Why would they bother coming up with Well, that, that, that hits right at the, the you know, my talk probably didn't address the themes of this meeting very well, but that gets right at it, right? What are the returns to these various uh, quantitative phenotypes, like the return, economic the returns? The return on IQ is not really good. The return on height, attractiveness, these are good returns. Mm -hmm. And we have that data. Let me put in one more thing. General equilibrium effects. General equilibrium effects. Great. Well, one of the points is there are things in which you want to be taller than other people, but it doesn't really do the, the whole group any good to all be taller. After a while, they're, they're needed to buckle or something. So again, uh, there are positional advantages and there's absolute advantages. So, for example, if you were smarter and you were less likely to walk into an open manhole, that's an absolute advantage. Where, but there's also advantages which are it's not what's useful to be smarter than other people, but there's also uses to just being smart. Whereas, for example, there are cosmetic things that don't have an absolute use in yourself in themselves. For well, example, I mean, we, we actually have, I mean, as an economist, right? We actually know what people will pay for because we know what stuff is worth. And not falling into a manhole, people don't pay a lot for it uh, in that sense. But people could get paid five thousand dollars more a year for every whatever it is inch that they're taller. And if I want my kid to make more than me, that, that's easy because I'm so short. I'm going to buy him four inches. Well, people pay a lot of money to people pay a lot of money to send their kids to private schools. Uh, yeah. You know, um, but that's because that's better correlated with income and outcomes than uh, than your IQ. 
So I, I, I don't. Q, he also was 112 according to the previous presentation. Yeah, I mean, what a right. disappointment. Yeah. Well, I, I hope it turns out that IQ is actually economically valuable. In, in Silicon Valley, it's quite valuable. So. I actually thought that the, the effect of height is uh, sort of confounded by IQ just because, you know, it's sort of a, a relatively good proxy for IQ. Yeah. Well, I mean, Danny Reed is the one I think who's done he studies best. And what he says is that within a given field, you see a decent um, correlation between IQ and income, but that globally, uh, people seem to sort of randomly assort by fields. And so you don't get the global return on IQ. Yeah, well, I personally feel that uh, smarter people often get more life satisfaction, sorry economists, uh, from solving problems and learning things uh, and inventing and creating beautiful things than from counting their dollars. And as somebody who used to you run us. don't know anything about economics. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the sense, no, no economist would have said that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But IQ is correlated with health and longevity. And I mean, it, it has some good correlation with it, <laughs> but it certainly has a very strong correlation with occupational status. That's the Wisconsin longevity. Yeah, that's definitely true. So it, I would think that that's related to well, well being. Idiocracy issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what. I mean, I, I know I know what you're going to pay for when you go to Silicon Valley. <laughs> Probably Angelo too, but uh, for the larger community, I think when they go to Singapore, they're buying height and attractiveness. Well, Angelo they, used to have a Chinese gift. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, so just, they would be a billion <laughs> Chinese. I don't think that they would all have Los Angeles values. I mean, you have to you have to see what who, who's going to have the, the purchasing power in 50 years from now. You see what what people will pay for in terms of this is you can look at what people are trying to pay for and when they're looking for donor aids and when they're looking for donor aids they're looking for high SAT. Yeah, high SAT. So we know that there's yeah. Well, there's, I could show you a figure actually. Hmm? That's a great answer. That's yeah. Answer. Well, but those are the people who are looking for donor aids. Well, that's these that's are okay. the pioneers that yeah. Those are the people who are going to go out and engineer okay. yeah. They don't look for high to. They look and for they they look look athletic the measure of beauty. Come they on. look for athletic ability. They look for high SAT scores. They advertise it. In fact, there's a, 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 an example from this university of the, an advertisement in their newspaper looking for, if you go to elite colleges, you ask for people with high SAT scores. And, uh, and, and they also want photographs. So they do care about those things, too. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. there are other things they care about. Familial too. Hmm? They look for familial Well, think, think of people who their children are, you know, predictably going to have trouble in college, getting through college. I mean, there are, there are you know, we're used to some kind of tail distribution, but for a big bulk of the population, a good college degree is beyond their mental capability. And wouldn't you pay a lot of money if you thought there was a chance you could move your kid from that side to the other side? I think you'd pay a lot of money. Okay, I think we should uh, Thanks. stop. Thanks.